Yeah, I will tell you that some of the the most interesting feedback really comes around that that career roadmap. Um, and I think that's one of my favorite Say a little bit more things. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, again, going back to, to Schwab, um, when I started, when I first started um, doing that presentation, I started doing it to some larger audiences. I got really? some feedback through my management channels that some people were taken aback by having a roadmap. And, and I thought to myself, why? Right. So I'm naming where I want to go. I'm saying sure. here's our specific roles that I'd like to understand you know, that I think might be a good fit. I can't understand why that would be. And some people are like, well, it seems, seems aggressive. And it, it's, it was, so it was an interesting conversation to have, but I also think yeah. it's one of the most powerful things that if you can, if you can put a piece of paper and say, here's where I am and here's five or six potential roles that I think are my next step and five or six potential roles that I think are the step after that, it totally changes the conversation so some of it is, is, again, you have to put yourself out there and be willing to say, no, this is, this is good. Hi, this is James Gray. Welcome to the podcast. In this episode, I speak with Ryan Reed. Ryan leads IT at JSR Corporation, and we have a wide-ranging conversation around topics of enterprise IT, the applications of artificial intelligence, and Ryan's journey to, to look inward and how that has navigated his career and how he's taken that foundation to the organization he leads around developing talent and encouraging and leading them to take ownership of their career and architect career roadmaps that lead them to the type of work that brings out their best in themselves and the impact of the organization. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, this is James Gray, and welcome to the Gray Matter Podcast. My guest today is Ryan Reed. Uh, Ryan leads IT at the JSR Corporation as part of the One Digital Organization, which is responsible for helping to digitize JSR. In his current role, he has worldwide responsibility to work across all of JSR companies to establish a federated enterprise IT organization. In addition to working on a modernization strategy, Ryan has continued to lead and mentor employees on how to develop their career strategy. Prior to JSR, Ryan worked in financial services at Charles Schwab, where he spent time as the technology leader for the equity compensation business, as well as a software architect modernizing client communications. At Schwab, Ryan continued to refine his career strategy while also mentoring individuals and leading workshops for personal development based on the career strategy framework. Before Schwab, Ryan was with Microsoft in Denver in Redmond for five years. He held multiple roles during his tenure, including program manager, enterprise architect, and regional IT manager. In these roles, he primarily focused on creating a roadmap for modernization and migration to the cloud for Microsoft IT. Before joining Microsoft, Ryan was an IT director for Sandos, a subsidiary of Novartis AG where he ran IT for manufacturing regulatory quality lab and research teams. Um, Ryan has a bachelor's degree in biochemistry for, uh, from Colorado College and holds an MBA from the University of Colorado. Ryan Reed, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, James. Happy to be here. Excited about yeah. it. Yeah, it's it's great to um, great to see you again. Obviously, we 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 recently caught up and spent some time together uh, back in the IT organization at Microsoft. And uh, perhaps before we get into uh, the conversation, you can share a little bit about um, the JSR Corporation as well as uh, where do you spend most of your time these days? Sure. Yeah. So JSR is a uh, we are a chemical manufacturing company. Uh, we are based out of Japan, uh, so headquartered in Tokyo, and we work across a number of different industries. But really, the underlying uh, component of that is is really through chemistry. And uh, so we have uh, areas where we um, make raw materials for semiconductor manufacturing through photoresist. Uh, we have a plastics business, and we also have a life sciences business which is where I joined JSR. And so in our life sciences business, we do uh, have a contract research organization helping with uh, developing drugs. And then we have a contract development manufacturing organization, which is, is really where we start to scale up drug manufacturing for uh, phase one, two, and three clinical trials, as well as commercial drug manufacturing. Um, and then we also have a, a diagnostics business. Uh, so we have a, mm. um, 
uh, one of the biggest in vitro uh, diagnostics business in Japan. And uh, we also, that goes worldwide. So really a diverse set of companies. Uh, yeah. Kind of the underlying is, is really just, uh, you know, chemistry and using uh, technology through chemistry to, to make uh, the world a better place. Yeah, no, that, that sounds really interesting. And I can, I can imagine from an IT perspective, right, that's probably fairly challenging if you're in multiple locations, um, different geographies, different cultures. It, it, it really is. And um, it's, it's, the company has grown up through both the organic growth as well as inorganic growth. And then you know, focusing on those different industries has had different areas of focus from an IT perspective. So you, know, you you'd said, well, where am I spending my time? And it's really trying to execute on a strategy of how to build out a federated IT organization. So historically, JSR has worked in, in a lot of silos. So each company has kind of been running on its own. And we really recognize that if we want to unlock the power of data, so as we have all these companies doing different things through chemistry, we, we have a lot of data that we're generating, but in order to be able to unlock that, we also realize that we have to have an environment that allows people to work across all of those different data silos as well as company silos. And so in my role, what I'm trying to do is really help create a federated IT environment. So what are the core areas of IT that should be more centralized, should be more consistent across the companies? And what are those areas of IT that still should remain with the subsidiary companies? and allowing those companies to focus on differentiated technology or differentiated applications. And so that's really where, where I'm spending that time is trying to, trying to figure out, well, how do we, now that we have this, we have this strategy, how do we kind of put it together? How do we really help show the different areas, the different business units? Here's the value that we're going to bring by, by doing this model. How do you give up a little bit of control of IT in order to gain more value? <laughs> No, that's really interesting. And I know when we were at Microsoft, right, it was kind of a somewhat of a similar strategy. Um, and it sounds like at JSR, it sounds like data is really a, a key enabler for, as you said, kind of unlocking um, this kind of power through through chemistry. I'm just curious, like over maybe the last year or two, you know, what have been some either projects or new capabilities that you found helpful for kind of accelerating your strategy? So as part of our overall digitization effort, we've really had this roadmap that says, we know that we need to aggregate the data. And then once we can start to aggregate that data, we have multiple tools that we can use to unlock that aggregate data. So we've really been building out a platform on AWS. We've mm. been leveraging a lot of the AWS tools that natively are, are available. So how do we think about creating a, you know, a data lake and how do we apply that data to the data lake? How do we also uh, think about how do we um, uh, add more to the data? How do we, how do we create the metadata, right? To the, that we can understand when the data is coming in from multiple different disparate sources and the companies might have different ways that they've, they've named that data. How do we sure. actually bring it all together and make sense of it? And so that's been one project that's really been undergoing for about the past three years. But what we're really starting to see is we're really starting to see the fruits of our labor. So we have more and more systems that are actually feeding data into our data lake. And now with that, we're going to be able to start using machine learning to start unlocking some of those insights to that data. So we've been really focusing on, we want to get to the point where we have a aggregated set of data where we can then use things like machine learning to be able to create insights and then use you know, dashboards that we can empower users to also create their own insights using uh, kind of self-serve dashboards. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And I know um, having worked with you at Microsoft, I know one, certainly one of your strengths is right around uh, architecture, around enterprise IT. Um, and you know, as you described kind of balancing what do you do centrally from right a, a centralized IT perspective to kind of have those standards that um, really uh, get uh, you know used and applied across the organization while enabling right um, the uh, some things to kind of really happen on the edge right enabling yeah. agility for those businesses and I know that's always a, like a little bit of tension there but as you yeah. said to be able to get and derive some of the value there needs to be right? Some centralization to the, to, to, to the effort. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We're, we're looking at really some of those 
for lack of a better term, commodity things that every company must do, right? So every company must run a network. You know, every company must have security. All those, you know, the basic IT operations, whether you're running a compute workload on-prem or whether you're running that workload in the cloud, that those things every company needs to do. And they're critical, right? They're, the right. expectation of every company today is that those things just work. They work seamlessly. No one has to think about it. Those are the things we're going after to really say, if we can connect those across the corporation in a consistent way, not only are we going to help those businesses just kind of run it, forget it, we can start talking about the economy of scale, but then also we start to unlock vehicles for us to be able to aggregate even more data. So where we might have data that's that's sitting on a file share at a, on a server, you know, in in Belgium, you know, now all of a sudden if we start to connect that infrastructure, that data is no longer isolated to that file share in Belgium, but really could be accessible by someone in Japan or China, depending on what the case may be. So that's really what we're we're trying to sure. enable. Sure, and you know, I know you mentioned uh, machine learning. Um, have there been any any kind of recent um, ideas around how to leverage any of these? kind of latest uh, AI technology to, to enable your business yeah. in some way? Yes, we have been, we've been looking at a, at a lot of different things. And so I think, you know, generative AI, conversational AI, all of these large language models, they're, they're awesome. I love the technology. I love understanding more about it. And I do think that it's really going to have power to transform business. I, I think that as we look back in about three years, it's going to be amazing what we see. But right now, what I'm what I'm seeing in the market is a lot of theoretical things. So it's a lot of marketing saying, hey, we've got this, this tool that's using this large language model. And then you say, okay, great. Yep, sign me up. I want to do a proof of concept. And they're like, well, we're not ready yet. It, it's, it's coming. It's not, it's not fully developed yet. <laughs> we don't have access to it yet. Or it's it's we're gonna have access, but it's cost prohibitive right now. So what I'm seeing right now is is a lot of potential. So you'd see a ton sure. of potential, but there's there's not as many opportunities to actually do some implementation. Uh, the closest thing that I've found right now is we're having some really interesting conversations with a couple of companies around conversational AI and really kind of how do you work with the service desk and, and can you sure. use conversational AI in that type of, of model that that's more than just a, if you will, traditional service desk chat bot. And it, it goes beyond that. So that's that's one area that we're seeing. Um, but other than that, what I'm seeing is that many of the tools that are out there that you could use today also require a lot of internal development. So at that point, it doesn't look that much different than doing your own set of custom development and using an AI tool or a machine learning tool in a platform like AWS or Azure. Nice. Sure, sure. and. Um, you know, from my perspective, right, I think you'd probably agree, right, a lot of this new value is going to come through um, not only, right, it, the ability to bring your own data, right, to bear with these large language mm -hmm. models is really, I think, really the, the, the key there, right, to make it really applicable to your business and very domain specific and leveraging that. And I know, as you just said, that's been a major focus around getting a lot of this data infrastructure right so that you're in a position right when the time uh, is right around leveraging some of these emerging technologies. Yeah, that's the that's the key, right? I mean, it's it's how can how can I use this this tool across all of my different disparate data sets internally and how can I start unlocking those insights? I mean, in a lot of ways, that's the platform that we've been trying to build and we've been building in, in AWS, but in, in some ways, depending on what the tool is, could really help accelerate and unlock those insights of data that we may not even be thinking about. So data that's just sitting there that we may not have that ability. Sure. Conversely, though, that's also the scary part of it, right? Because you talk about so many of those large language models and they're like, oh, yeah, we just ingest all your data. We put it in the model. And they're like, wait, no, those, those are company secrets. You yeah. can't have those. You've got to isolate those. So how do you apply the, the data set and train that data set with a large language model, but not expose your company data to everyone else who might be using the tool? Uh, again, I've seen some interesting sure. conversations around what they're doing to anonymize the data and those types of things. Still, still, you know, the devil's in the details, right? Of, of sure. okay, do we really feel comfortable with exposing all of that data to that model or not? Sure. 
And, um, you know, as you said, I, you know, the use case that you just described um, around service desk, right? Um, I think that's kind of low hanging fruit, right? There's been yeah. technologies around that, right? And being able to uh, support, right, all the internal uh, employees inside a company and be able to, right, save them time, leverage your organization, right, so that the folks in your IT team are spending time on the most, you know, kind of L3 type problems. Yeah. I think that's a low hanging use case. Exactly. I mean, it's, and even on the service desk, you know, a lot of people think that that's, oh, you're, so you're, you know, basically outsourcing service desk. It's like, no, we have, we have so many things we can be doing to make that sure. employee experience better, that digital exploit experience better. And it's the people who actually understand what are the problems that we're, we're encountering, whether it's people in the office or it's people that are remote. What are those things that we maybe just haven't had time to go fix because Dude. we're just responding to tactical stuff all the time. And so really it is, it's, it's kind of up-leveling, allowing people to focus on the things that add more value as opposed to necessarily saying, oh, we're just cutting costs by, by outsourcing something to, you know, an AI system. technology. Sure. Sure. And, um, you said you run on AWS or is it, it sounds like it's only one cloud you run on AWS. We no, we're so we're we are multi cloud. So we multi -cloud. are on AWS. We're on Azure. Uh, a lot of our development's been done in AWS based off of some of the tools that they've they've continued to deploy, um, as well as some of the skill set of some of our development team. Uh, but our our intent is fully to be cloud agnostic as much as possible, and you know, really leverage whatever cloud makes sense. Sure. Um, so we certainly still see. You know, we see that Azure's really, you know, they've got some advantages, obviously, especially in the Office 365 space, that that overall employee experience. But we see that, you know, Google still has some really good stuff as far as when you get to really big data sets and you really want to start to apply some of that stuff. Google's cloud is really interesting as well. So, yeah, really, we're not trying to lock ourselves down to any one cloud. We want our data to be portable as much as possible. We want those workloads to go to whatever cloud makes sense. Yeah, and I, I, you know, that's been my experience as a CIO as well. And right, a lot of times through acquisition, you don't get a choice, right? Where yeah. you're going to be in many cases hybrid cloud, right? Through kind of acquisition or certain regions, certain capabilities. And I think your strategy of right leveraging uh, the platforms uh, who have certain capabilities that meet the use case, I think that's that's really spot on. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And, you know, um, you know, you also mentioned, right, this idea that, um, right, you, you've got all these different applications inside the company, right? And employees just expect those to be a dial tone, right? That yeah. throughout the, right, throughout the whole kind of operations, whether it's, um, you know, office locations or manufacturing locations, right? That's a huge responsibility, um, for right, a leader like you to oversee and ensure all of that gear and all those kind of capabilities kind of work seamlessly. I, I, you know, any any thoughts or feedback on, on that as well? Yeah, it's it's um, you know as we think about kind of what that digital employee experience is, it's getting more and more important. As we think about a younger workforce coming in, we have what's the the digital natives right they're showing sure. up and they've always been they've always had an iphone yeah you know, their first device is typically an iphone or something like that a smartphone and so they expect to be able to do anything anywhere and to your point they're not used to being able to say well that's that's only an on-prem application that you have to go through a vpn to access that's not how they want to work and that's not how you're going to be able to have a highly engaged workforce so those are certainly things we're thinking about, which is what is it that we're doing to make sure that we remove those barriers, that we can give the people the accessibility to do the work that they need to do wherever they need to do it. Yet at the same time, obviously keeping security at the edge is first and foremost. And so some of it is, is some cases we need to upgrade applications. Some cases we are looking at more SaaS applications versus sure. on-prem applications. Um, in other cases, what we're also starting to see a little bit now is more and more is maybe starting to break apart some of these big monolithic mm -hmm. applications and using more point solutions. Uh, and so as we can think about if I can aggregate data from point solutions, then I don't really need these big monolithic applications to do everything. And so sure. that's, a, that's an interesting trend that we're starting to kind of see more and more is that 
well, I don't need just one application to do my HRIS. I could use four or five different applications and aggregate the data in the back end. From a user experience perspective, maybe I, as long as I keep that seamless, and then as a data perspective, keep it seamless, then I can really enable some potential different opportunities as opposed to these big, huge projects to do upgrades or to add new features. So that's certainly yeah. something we're seeing more and more of. Yeah, no, that's an interesting that's an interesting strategy. And I know, right, from your Microsoft days, you have lots of experience, right, uh, from an architecture standpoint. And, you know, when I think about agility as well, right, having been a CIO, right, you, as you said, you, you can't afford these long, costly, big, right? You need to be able yeah. to innovate. You need to be able to innovate on the edge. And as you yeah. said, right, there's, there's all these new capabilities that allow you to do some of the heavy lifting from the data perspective on the back end that allow you to, in some cases, choose a best of breed approach. Yeah, totally. Especially with so many companies really trying to adopt Agile. So when you think about Agile in the sense of traditional software development, very easy. But if you try to apply Agile to some big project, let's just say you're doing an SAP upgrade, all of a sudden that becomes really, really hard to try to get this Agile mindset. And you can do it for sure. But when you want to say, well, I want to do you know, one specific area, I want to move faster, or I want to move at a different pace than the rest of a, say, a big upgrade, it makes it really hard. And so sure. now if you can start to break some of these things apart that say, you know, it, it becomes a little bit more and more like the microservices architecture. So, you know, as we were talking about, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago, right? It's how do you think about microservices and all these interactive services where you have a common data layer and you might have a common user experience, but in between you have a set of services that can do different workloads. That's what we're starting to see a little bit more with applications because now we can also start to think about agile implementation and agile iteration mm -hmm. on applications as opposed to what we've done traditionally. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I think that it, it, it totally makes sense, right? To take that kind of approach and have, uh, right? Some decoupling of those capabilities that allow you to innovate those, yeah. you know, point solutions kind of over time. Um, yeah, so what I'd like to do is uh, perhaps just transition a little bit from the technology side, which I know we love, right? We love uh, technology, yeah. but I'd like to transition a bit to talk about um, some things related to, right, how do we as leaders, as technology leaders, right, develop ourselves, but also develop, right, the talent in our organizations and what have been some of the experiences that you've done throughout your career to, to kind of really do that well uh, and a really good example. And so I'd like to take us back to almost 10 years ago, right, where you were one of the first people to join, um, you know, a workshop that I had this real curiosity um, to go explore, right, this, this framework around, right, how do we, right, uh, at that time inside of Microsoft, really take ownership of our career, um, get in touch with that, look inside, and then be in a better position, right, to be clear about where we're going, um, being able to engage people in our story. And so I'm just curious, right? Um, the, the first part of that workshop was really taking this pause to, to look inside, right? And do some introspection. Yeah. I'm just curious, tell me a little bit about what that felt like and what were some of the things that you learned from that, that workshop or that experience? Yeah. Um, so for me, when I was at Microsoft, the timing of this was was so perfect. So I'd been at Microsoft, I think uh, maybe a couple of years at that point, and was really trying to figure out where did I, where did I fit. Um, so really enjoyed being at Microsoft, but it is a very dynamic place with a bunch of different things going on, and I was really trying to figure out where I fit. And so when you when you came and said, hey, here's here's this you know, process that we're going to go through, it was it was a great timing for me because I was, it was directly aligned with what I was interested in. But the, the first, yeah, that first step of trying to figure out you know, who I am and, and why, it was both interesting and really challenging. Uh, so I'd always had kind of career goals, like, but they've been kind of maybe one or two career goals, very high level, and then oftentimes many years in the future without really much detail around it. And so for me, this trying to slow down and figure out what's important to me outside of the context of yearly objectives was the first time that I'd ever done that. 
So mm-hmm. before it, it was always, okay, this is my job role. This is the objectives. And if I exceed on the objectives and I get to the next job role, great. I've, I've made progress, right? Sure. And and in theory, if I, if I keep taking those steps, then I make enough progress to get to that lot longer term goal. But I never really thought about it holistically. Uh, and, and at the time, I'd also been approaching very much having this concept of a work life and a private life completely separate. And um, you, this, this really kind of said, you know, you, you have to break down the barriers because you spend so much time at work and you spend so much of your person and your effort in work. And that also comes home with you. Sure. There's really no way to keep those two things separate. And so, like I said, so the, the, I remember one of the first weekends trying to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do, do this, right. I'm going to do this homework of figuring out what is my purpose? What is my, my why? And I couldn't, I was like, I, I can't think this way. And so trying to actually slow down and say, all right, independent of Ryan working at Microsoft, what's important? Like, what do I want to do? Why am I doing it? And, and what is it, you know, that this job is doing what's interesting in the job, but what's interesting for me as a person. So it was definitely a first to step mm. back and really think about myself in that way from a career perspective. Like I've done, I had done some of that maybe from a personal perspective, but I'd never done that in a career context and then bringing that personal and professional life together. Sure. And um, I I heard other feedback from other people as well. Like James, that was really hard in some cases, very emotional, sometimes very right introspective or having to really kind of look inside. Um, what having kind of gone through that, and I know I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about right what you continue to do um, that might be some techniques and habits around how do you keep yourself kind of grounded. But you know, what would you say some of the kind of influences or impacts or results of kind of doing that, getting to that why, getting to that purpose? So, <laughs> yeah. But maybe lots to unpack there. Um, so it, it was, um, like, like I said, for me, one of the big things was kind of breaking down some of those barriers. I think maybe today, you know, 10 years later, I, I, maybe it's maybe it's not as much that, that people have those barriers because we are, are so interconnected now. Um, but um, that is, I think, one of the, the bigger things was to do that. And then uh, also really have the confidence to talk about that. Uh, that was maybe one of the the more interesting things is, okay, it's like, you know, we spent this time, we developed this stuff. And then I remember you're like, okay, now you have to go talk to your boss about it. And, <laughs> you know, thinking about, oh man, I'm, you know, this is, this is, I don't, I don't talk to my boss about these things, right? Yeah. I talk to my boss about, you know, here's, here's where I am on my projects. Here's what I'm doing, those types of things. And in this case, now you have some, some really personal things, but um, so I remember going through and, and luckily I was, I was, um, yeah, it was great to have some really good managers uh, while I was at Microsoft who were very encouraging and open to these conversations and uh, had those conversations and uh, really was powerful, really changed the dynamic of the conversation from just a, you know, okay, here's work, 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 but really kind of, you know, who you are as a person and being able to bring myself as a person to work. And so yeah. that's, that's one of the big things I think is, is so one of the ways that I continue to, to do that is when I have a new manager or in a lot of cases, also when I meet with some other leaders that I'm going to be maybe working with in a very uh, you know, tight perspective over a longer period of time, I'll walk through parts of, of the career strategy with them. And I'll talk to them a little bit about what's, what is my, what is my why? Um, you know, how did I get to where I am and what is some of my why? So again, so they have a little bit of context about mm. who I am and potentially how I'm going to approach some of the things that we're working together. So that would be one of the areas that I've really seen sure. is, is that that helps drive it. The other thing it helps is, is really for me revisiting um, to, to kind of say, is this, is this still aligned? You know, are the, the things that I've, I put down still aligned or has life changed enough that maybe I'm transitioning into a different phase and maybe some of these things need to be updated. No, that, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. And I think this is another reminder, right, for all of us that, you know, what I saw during, certainly during my times at Microsoft, a lot of people th- thought that they didn't have agency. You know, I'd hear, yeah. oh, James, you know, like there's all these yeah. reorgs going on, da, 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 da. And I would say, you know, you, you need to 
right? You're in a sale. You need to kind of put that sale up, right? And set direction and really engage other people in your cause. Otherwise, in these large corporations, right? You're just you're just going to get lost, right? And so totally. I, 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 yeah. I encourage people that you need to take ownership, right? And do do some of the things you just described, which is you you have to right. Um, engage other people in your cause, right? As you you said the example, totally. right? You take people through, hey, here's Ryan Reed. Let me take you through these things. Um, and I also would use that during my my times during a skip level. And this, you know, people may yeah. want to do this. What I would do is I would send those like five slides or whatever. This yep. is me. This is who I am. These are my strengths. This is kind of my roadmap. This is where I'm going. This is my develop development, you know, that's me on paper. And I remember meeting uh, a skip level right, new organization and I sent him my deck, I don't know, a number of days before the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and he's like, that was awesome because we would have spent the first, what, half hour of the conversation around, well, who are you? And like, he said, yeah. you know, that changed it because now we can talk about, you know, your place in the organization, how can we can help and, other, and to your point, it completely changes the organization because you're very thoughtful about who you are and where you're going and how that one plus one equals three. Yeah, I think I, I think you're you're exactly right. And I think that, that concept of agency and really getting people on your side is, is critical. And whether that's either, you know, your manager um, or your skip level, but also any mentors that you might have across the organization or even especially in a, an organization like Microsoft that has kind of formal mentoring programs, you know, as you're trying to find those mentors, it's, it's a really good thing that you can find those people who can be advocates for you. Um, I will tell you that I also, I used it really uh, a lot when I was at Schwab, especially when I first joined Schwab. So, you know, I hadn't worked in financial services before. Schwab was, you know, in multiple different, um, you know, states and cities is at the time and leaders were kind of spread all over. And so, I really use the same concept so that I could go meet with some key leaders at Schwab and not only do that introduction of, hey, here's who I am and, and here's some of the things I'm interested in where I want to go. But again, as you said, it really helped accelerate the conversation to now they had an understanding of who I was. And I found that not only were they open to being advocates, but they were also more open in the conversation about themselves. And so we tended not to have that just surface level conversation that you might get with that first 30 minute meeting or maybe only minute, 30 minute meeting with a mentor potential, right? Now all of a sudden you're having a deep conversation around that. I'll tell you yeah, another example is, is I was, I was interviewing for a role and um, it was, you know, kind of one level up with a VP that I hadn't worked for. So I sent her this, my, my deck, right? So I sent her my deck <laughs> before the interview and I just said, Hey, you know, I know you've seen my resume, but I just wanted to share some of these things about me. And we actually spent the whole interview talking about the deck. And she really? was asking me questions about what is my, you know, she was more interested in those types of things. She's like, well, tell me more about this and let's talk about this, right? As opposed to really talking about the job and trying to interview on the skill set, she we talked really about, you know, who I was and where I wanted to go. And so it was, it was a very interesting interview. I, Unfortunately, didn't didn't get the job, but it was it was a um, you know it all worked out. But it was a really interesting conversation. No, that's a really interesting example. And and so, what did it look like? You, as you said, you sent the you sent her the deck in advance. It sounds like, and and she got a chance yeah. to kind of digest that a bit. And, and to your point, totally changed kind of the conversation. And I too have found when you can like really concisely make it easy for people to understand, right? They're in a much better position to help an advocate, right? Advocate yeah. for you, right? I totally. think the thing is we got to remember, right? As, as people who are managing our own career, as well as leaders, right? Is that they're not mind readers, right? They yeah. are not mind yep. readers. So you can't expect them to like, right? Take responsibility around, right? Shaping your path. They're there certainly to support, but when you can tell a really interesting story about who you are and where you're going and the great and wonderful things that you want to do, you know, 99 times out of 100 people will just jump on the bandwagon to help you totally. however they can. Yeah. 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 I will tell you that some of the, the most interesting feedback really comes around that, that career roadmap. Um, and I think interesting. that's one of my favorite Say a little bit more things. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, again, 
going back to to Schwab, um, when I started, when I first started um, doing that presentation, I started doing it to some larger audiences. I got really? some feedback through my management channels that some people were taken aback by having a roadmap. And, and I thought to myself, why? Right. So I'm naming where I want to go. I'm saying sure. here's our specific roles that I'd like to understand, you know, that I think might be a good fit. I can't understand why that would be. And some people are like, well, it seems seems aggressive. And it, it's it was so it was an interesting conversation to have. But I also think yeah. it's one of the most powerful things that if you can if you can put a piece of paper and say, here's where I am and here's five or six potential roles that I think are my next step and five or six potential roles that I think are the step after that, it totally changes the conversation. So some of it is, is again, you have to put yourself out there and be willing to say, no, this is, this is good. I'm not saying that you have to go promote me right now. I'm saying right. this is where I want to work towards. And again, it, it was, there were some people who kind of bristled about saying, well, don't you seem like you're aggressive? And I, I, I don't think so. Right. Again, going back to the, I mm -hmm. have agency over where I want to go. I'm not waiting for someone else in the company to tell me where I want to go. And, and then ultimately it was then with a mentor relationship, a couple mentor relationships at Schwab, having that same conversation on that same roadmap that ultimately got me to the next step in my roadmap. And had I not had that, had I not named, you know, this is the th position that I think I want to go in and had conversations around that position, I wouldn't have been, you know, potentially I wouldn't have been in consideration for some of those. But because of that, I had a lot more people coming to me who said, hey, I have a job that looks like the thing that you want. Are you interested in having a conversation? So it started out a little bit. People were like, yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of, you know, seems pushy. Um, mm, interesting. And, and really ended up being, okay, it's not being pushy. And oh, by the way, here, we're going to help you get to where you want to go. Well, and I think that's just it, right? I, I think one, we got to remember we are responsible for our life and our career. Like no, like the Calvary is not coming to, to help us would be kind of one perspective. And I think, you know, um, just, just for a little bit of context, what Ryan's talking about is, is just a, you know, kind of as IT and as product people, right? Just that roadmap of what does it look like through time? And I think that that's kind of the visual piece, right? And and I think this is another thing that's really powerful. When you can show someone a very simple visual about kind of where you are and what might be potential pathways, you don't really know, right? But you're opening up the conversation around, right? Some potential pathways to make them conscious and talk to people who might be along that path and, and get some feedback, whether that's doing a, you know, um, a, a, an interview, right. A, a mock type interview or perspective, um, to get from someone who might be independent and then getting some feedback around, Hey, am I even qualified? And for me yeah. to even get that job, I did that at Microsoft, right. I'd go for these informationals and say, Hey, I, I love your team. I love your org, but tell me like, what is the friction? What would I need to do to really overcome that? And knowing that in advance and having people really help you objectively um, give you some guidance and some feedback. And so thanks for sharing that um, example around having a roadmap. I think for us who are builders, right? It just becomes naturally, right? We, we spend yeah. so much time in our careers in the technology field, like building roadmaps for our products, yeah. right? And, and capabilities, it's no different than doing from ourselves but a lot of times people don't get around to it and they really miss that opportunity around bringing and, and engaging other people in that story. Yeah. And one, one thing I just want to pick up on that you mentioned is, is that kind of that, what could the next job be look like? So one of the things I do when I'm working with people on their career strategy um, is, is I challenge them that as they think about a roadmap or as they think about what's next is either go find that job inside the company you're working for or go jump on Indeed or something like that and go find a job description for some other company that's that's kind of has that title and look through it and, and really look through and say, well, what are the things that I think I have? What are the things that I don't don't have? And and is there opportunities within my current role to go get experiences around yeah. that to help me build up towards that? But I I I have my personal one one of the things I did it was it, it was both at Microsoft and then again as when I was at Schwab was yeah I, I went out and I got job descriptions and I 
saved the job description and I put it in my folder right next to my career strategy and I looked at what are the details, what are the skill sets, what are the opportunities that I need to go after as part of my development plan in sure. order to do that. So another, I think, really valuable tool of thinking about where you want to go, but it goes back to you have to kind of slow down enough to think about where you sure. want to go before you can get to some of those, those actions. Yeah. yeah, and I love the example that you just gave, right? A lot of times too, we don't think we have agency in our current job, right? To get more of what we do. And, and I had used that with, um, with one of my directs at Microsoft where she wanted to have more experience in something. Like she just said, like, I want more experience in that. Well, we, we kind of reshaped her role, right? For her to get that. Because without that, it was really going to be tough for her to do right more impactful work inside my org, as well as be able to to kind of move on right to kind of the next thing. Sure. Um, yeah. So thanks for really sharing that um, that example. And and to your point, just like you have to be conscious enough, right? And yeah. we are in organizations that change all the time, right? And um, I, I I remember one. Uh, we are going on at, at Microsoft. I was uh, at the pro club running um, and thinking about right this. And, and I've been in my role for, I don't know, five or so years. And my team was great, really didn't need me. And like James, we have the three guard. We want to continue to just, you know, take your team and stuff like that. And I'm like, and as I thought about it and what I did very similar to you, I took my deck, sent it to um, the leader and I had already been reassigned to this leader. And I said, you know what? Here's my strategy. Get me closest to that as possible. Yeah. And I actually, before the thing was finalized, they moved me to a different team. And <laughs> even the manager who I was supposed to go to work for, he's like, James, that's totally cool. Like, do it for you. Totally understand. Yeah. And so that's another piece, right? It, it, it doesn't become this, this goofy thing, right? You're just, you're trying to put yourself in the place in the organization to do the most impactful work, doing the work, right? And, it, and it's not rocket science, but again, people, people need to hear the story to be able to assist you, right, in that capacity. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, it's a really good point because I think that, you know, so as a leader, right, I want the, the person to be in the right position to be successful. And if they can help define what that looks like for them, I understand the business goals. I, I spend a lot of time on understanding strategy and scorecards and KPIs and all those types of things. And I, I know that I have a set of, of resources, both internal and external that I can use to go help me achieve those goals. But ultimately, I want someone who, who's excited about what they're gonna do because they're gonna put more time and effort and passion into that thing. And, sure. and if, if I'm just shoving someone into a role and asking them to do things that's really not aligned to where they wanna go, that not only are they not going to necessarily do a great job, but they're probably not going to be there long, right? Either they're going to start saying, hey, I need a different job. I need a different team. You know, I'm going to be looking outside the company. And so that's another sure. thing that I've really found now as a leader who's, who's helping to talk to people about this is that it's so important. I want those people on my team who are really excited about doing those things. And if they're not, I'd also like to be the leader who says, you know, if this isn't a great fit, let's find you a good fit. Sure. Because I'd rather bring in someone who's going to be a good fit. No, I, and I, I, I love that example. And actually, I was going to kind of go there right next is that, um, uh, that when we make these conversations more transparent, more trusting, more open, right? It becomes this really uncomfortable thing to actually a very empowering thing. To your point, um, and I know I've had those conversations, right? Um, I remember even at Microsoft, right? Oh, do I tell my manager I'm, I'm actually looking inside? You're know, like, that was a big no-no. Yeah. For my team was yeah. like, hey, I want to be your biggest advocate, right? If you want to go yeah. interview, and I know, I know they changed the rules and stuff, but at that time, it was like this, you know, people felt like they needed to be hushed, but I wanted to be like the best advocate for people um, in my team. And then to your point, if there's not a fit there, then let's just kind of together, right? Manage the, the transition so that, yeah. right? As a leader, you have a business to manage and continuity. And then you want somebody to really have a, a good offboarding and runway to, to go make that yeah. transition. So I think it, it can totally change um, the experience, right, for the person as well as the manager, because they're very caring in the way they go about that. 
and in having this open and transparent. And when it's about the person, right, then I yeah. think it becomes something that's genuine. Yeah, and I think that that's um, taught. Yeah, I mean, being open is is a lot of times can be really scary, right? That there's now <laughs> yeah. this this really it, it's a it's just a different conversation and. Yeah, so many times I feel like employees can be very guarded because they're just like, sure. okay, I met my objectives, I can keep my job. And now you're going to come in and say, well, I want to want to change things. Um, and you know, some of it depends on the company, and some of it depends on the culture of the company. Some of it depends on your manager. Um, I had I've I've had a manager again back now when I was at Schwab, who was as we were having some of these conversations, like you know, just started openly talking about, well, what's the next job? Is it, you know, internal to Schwab or is it not? How can I connect to you? You know, mm. and it was, it was really, you know, very freeing to be able to then have this conversation of, you know, talking to a manager like, Hey, you know, I, I saw this job and I think I'm going to go apply and just have a conversation about it. Um, again, that, that the dynamic just changes, but if you don't start with something to talk about you and open the door, you can't have those conversations. So it may be that you start to open the door and, and you, you kind of put yourself out there a little bit and yeah. it's not received well. Okay. Then you kind of understand that maybe that influences what's next. Yeah, um, no, I, yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, so I, I certainly have seen that, uh, that, that, that taking that step and opening yourself up a little bit more, being a little bit more authentic is, is yeah, it's scary, but it's also really freeing as far as where yeah. it can take you. Yeah, I think I think you make a good like. There needs to be this almost kind of catalyst for trust and for this openness. Yeah. And certainly, as a leader, you need to create that. But the person needs to actually right. And, you, and obviously, as a leader, you need to kind of help create that environment that you know kind of makes that certainly happen. But you have to be willing to say, "This is who I am." And to your point, also bring all of you. Certainly, what I encouraged at Microsoft, right? Like you're like bring all of you who you are. Right, bring that uniqueness. Bring all those things about who you are, so that people have a, a, a really great idea how you can best be leveraged. Um, I, and I think that that's so. That, I think that's a that's a critical point. So so there's there's especially in in today's culture, it's it's sometimes hard to bring all of you to work. Right, you might be afraid of of what people think about you for you know political belief or religious belief or whatever the case may be. Sure. The, I, I really find the career strategy is an awesome way that you can just kind of open yourself up in a non, if you will, non-threatening, non-aggressive way. You can just say, hey, this is who I am. And and you're having it in a conversation that's not specifically in a political context or an HR context, right? It's now this is who I am. And you can just open that conversation. And I've found that that really does allow it to open a conversation about who you are, what you believe, without necessarily being, uh, again, a, a, an aggressive way maybe of, sure. of doing that or or just burying it and saying, well, I, I don't feel like I have a, a, an opportunity to speak about who I am at this workplace because they don't believe the same thing I do. That's a good, that's an interesting perspective. And, you know, there's different cultures, obviously. And one of the things that I heard uh, from people actually in the workshop that you were at was, hey, James, I'm really introverted. You know, I don't feel comfortable going in front of people, um, kind of telling you who I am and where I'm going. And so, you know, part of it is like, one, you need to be able to tell your story. It doesn't mean it's in front of a thousand people, but at least it yeah. needs to be like with your manager and other caring people who are in your circle right. so that you gain a little bit of practice in a safe space. And what I saw every time I saw someone get in front of people, let's say 15 minutes and tell their story. The thing that I saw, I saw energy. I saw pride. Yep. I saw excitement. Yep. I saw like, just this is who and me, you know, even if it's like, as you said, really, really interesting things that you have, uh, you just didn't even know about a person. So I, I think thanks for really kind of sharing that perspective. Um, and so I'm kind of curious, let's say I'm a new I just joined your org in IT. Um, I know you take out time to coach, mentor people. What, what does that look like if I'm if yeah. I'm in your org and yeah, what does it look like? So what I typically do is whether it's a new person to my organization uh, or new peer or or new leader is is I really try to set up about forty five minutes and I walk them through my career strategy and I do that 
not so much so that they can say, hey, I, I want to do this, but as much as, again, just to show kind of who I am. And I'll tailor it to the audience, right? So I might move, remove some slides. I might keep some slides in, um, depending on what it is. A lot of times what I'll do is, is I'll even just, just do kind of, you know, my who I am and, and my career, kind of how did I get there so people have kind of that background. I start there and then I always kind of close it, which is saying, inviting them is if you, if there's something that you think is interesting, if you'd like to develop your career, if you'd like to talk more about this, yeah, please set up time, give it back to them and just say, Hey, my, you know, my calendar's open, set up 30 minutes. We can talk about this. I could talk you through about what it would look like to set that up when people do that. Right. So they have to want to do that. But when, when they do that, then really what I suggest is, is kind of a six month program where we connect on a monthly basis in person and we talk through kind of how they're developing their own career strategy. But in, in the interim, I also do kind of every two weeks, I'll just do a check in. Hey, how are things going? You know, have you made progress? In a lot of cases, remind them because everyone gets busy. And it, remember, it's kind of hard to actually sit down, slow down and take the time mm. to think about it. And so I think sometimes people think, oh, I'll just do that. Yeah, you know, whenever you get to it and it's like, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought. I don't want to actually set aside the time. And so you have to have kind of that accountability ongoing. And once, once we kind of get through that first define your, your why and your purpose at that point, people are like, oh, I get it. And they, they really start to get the, the ball rolling themselves. And we, we were able to do that. But I typically take about six months on a kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis with a, you know, kind of a 30 minute check-in uh, once a month. Once a month. Okay. You know, that's, that's interesting. And I, what, what I love about that example is just that is you're leading by example. Right. And so I can imagine that just really kind of, um, wow, like my leader is actually telling me who he is and how he got here and what his story looks like. And I, I would imagine they see that is really an invitation to do that themselves. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> that's, that's always the intent. <laughs> yeah. You've got to be a little bit vulnerable and say that this is not just, this is, this is leading by example. And, you know, really, yeah. uh, I, I do, you know, make sure that I include some of these things about how did I get to different positions and how did mm -hmm. I use my career strategy to make these decisions? Um, and so that's, yeah, that's been a, a pretty typical routine. I have had some people that I've, you presented this. I had I had one um, woman in particular that I presented this. She was a, a new grad. She'd been with the company for mm -hmm. about a year. I presented my career strategy to a larger group as part of an overall a development process that we were working on. And she she set up a meeting with me like the next day, and she'd already done her whole strategy <laughs> by, <laughs> by the next day. Um, so, you know, she was really fired up. It was, it was kind of cool to see she, and she actually did, she put a lot of thought into it. It was really good. Um, mm. but it was for the most part, it, it takes a little while for people to go on the journey. Well, and so I, I just wanted to second that, right. It, it's kind of a journey. It's not like something you do in an hour. Right. And it does take, right. Some quiet time, whether you want to yeah. go take a walk, whether you want to, you know, <clears throat> do it really on a weekend. And there's, there's some activation energy, right? Like, ah, oh, where do I start? Yeah. And the, what you just mentioned about the, the one story about this, this one, one uh, young woman reminds me of, of somebody at Microsoft who did the same thing. He saw me speak at one workshop that I was at, did not talk to him. He came to me like on Monday after the weekend and say, Hey James, like I went to your thing and like, here's my deck. And I was really blown away that within a very short time, you know, he put together his story. Um, and you know, the cool thing about it was actually, it reminds me, he actually did it with his wife, hmm. which is the first, really the first time I ever heard from someone yeah. who actually, you know, kind of like, ah, oh, no, my wife and I, now she worked at Microsoft as well. Um, uh, and she was actually the person who invited me to speak at the workshop. So maybe it was a little bit of, <laughs> uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, the priority, but I, they, they did it together. And I thought that that was so cool. Right. Because like, we're on this journey, certainly of our career, but we don't right? many of us who, who have partners and, and spouses, right. We're taking yeah. this journey together and ensuring oh. that there's alignment around who we are and where we're going and what we need for this to be a great relationship and a great career, right? Where we spend lots of our time, I think was an interesting, um, an interesting example. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, we're good. So any kind of final kind of thoughts around, right, as you think about, again, whether it's your own kind of development or anything that anything else that you'd maybe tell leaders who are maybe have never done this, right? Because it's not commonplace. Yeah. Like any kind of final things that you would kind of share with them? Yeah, I, I would really encourage everyone, whether you do the whole thing or not, to 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 pause and, and really kind of figure out your why. Why are you going to work? What are you doing beyond getting a paycheck and having a title? What is it that you're trying to do as part of your broader life, right? So there's there's kind of this, what is my life purpose? But there's this whole period of time in your career and you have a bunch of stuff going on, but why are you doing it? And if you can put aside the time, Take that energy, as you said, I think, you know, something like taking a walk or get away from the electronics. Think about it. Don't yeah. have any input except just kind of your own thoughts and, and put some of it down on paper. And, yeah. and I know, James, you have resources that people can reference. And, and I really would take some time to, to, to read some of those references and read through some of those types of things and then just go think about it for a while. And I, I personally like going on a walk and thinking about things. I definitely feel like it, it takes a little while for my brain to, to kind of disconnect from the emails and, and yeah. all those other things. And so going for a walk is a great way to do it. But really encourage everyone to really think about that. I'd also encourage you to th have your team think about it. So have a development conversation that's just not in the context of objectives. I don't, whether it's you're doing, whether you're great with objectives and you're checking in with your team every quarter and doing all those things that's still kind of a one year thing that's associated with a company goal. And you might have something that maybe is a development, but it's still a company based goal. So that for me is, is, I think just changes the conversation because now it's around, how are you developing that person over a longer period of time? And that might be a three year period, that might be a five year period, or it could be something faster, but now you're having a completely different conversation that's really focused on how you uh, help that person develop as a person. I think that's a great point. Really what I hear you saying, the, the meta point is create a forum, right? Where you're bringing maybe your team together and you're really there reinforcing the need for them to take ownership of their career and, and create yeah. something that's not specifically related to like, oh, we need to ship this like next month. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it kind of reminds me, I, I actually did one of those at Microsoft. There was a manager who was a leader there. He said, James, like, I want to create this forum and I want to do it by example. And, you know, we did a couple sessions where there was 10 or so of his directs and we actually had them create some of these artifacts, right, around um, some of their char char characteristics of where they are, as well as, and it could be really simple, taking out a sheet of paper right? And, and a pencil, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, yeah. magical and, and actually put some, some, right. Uh, some dots on pieces of paper and think about right in this roadmap, what are some of those destinations that, right. Yeah. That, that could be in, and, and I find it, it opens the creativity when you're not constrained to what do I actually need to ship or what do I actually have to do tomorrow? and really think about some of those things um, because those can also, right, as you said, it doesn't necessarily even have to be the next job, but it's likely going to reinforce what are some of the things I actually need to go do now, right, to overcome, right, the friction. Some of those friction are skills and knowledge, right, um, courses or experiences on the job experiences that we need to demonstrate that we have those skills and competencies. The other thing, as we know, is we need to look at who are the actual people who are going to help influence that transition, right? The people who are potentially stakeholders in the decision that could be a promotion, right? Are you invisible uh, to them? Are there anything that you've done to really establish a relationship so that, you know, you are not this person who is, is unknown when it becomes time for, let's say, you know, a, a new interesting opportunity or a transfer yeah. or a promotion, right? There's all kinds of things to kind of raise that level of consciousness that 
you do have agency, you do have to be yeah. responsible, and it can be something that's so much fun to engage other people in. So thanks for sharing those yeah. things around kind of what uh, you would do as a leader. And I hope uh, some of those things um, are helpful to other people. Any kind of final thoughts um, for uh, for folks? I mean, I think you kind of hit on where, where I would say is, is take control of your career. Uh, you do have agency and, you know, take some time to think about where you want to go and what, what that job is that you want to do. And you build on that through spending some time on thinking about what's important, thinking about the things that you like to do and you're good at doing and, and really kind of spending some time exploring. It doesn't mm. happen overnight. So don't think about just, Hey, I'm, I'm going to be able to spend you know, an hour doing this. It, it takes some time to kind of evolve and really think about this. If you could find a mentor that you can bounce some of these ideas off of awesome, go do that as well, but really take control of your career. And, and really you, you do have to define what that is. And, and as you do that, you're going to be able to find people who help yeah. support you in getting there. Yeah, no, thanks for, for leaving that as um, you know, a really good reminder to your point. A lot of people just go look for that, for that ne next job and they may not actually be very conscious of why that next job, right? And so doing some of the work around going inside, looking inside, getting calibrated around, right? Your values and your interests and your, as you said, kind of purpose and where you are on that roadmap really, right? It really um, sharpens the lens as you then go out and look outward around, is there an opportunity in your current job to reshape it? Is there an opportunity inside the organization? Or maybe, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to go out and, and look elsewhere. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Ryan, really thanks for making uh, time. If people want to find you, where's the best place to find you? Best way is uh, LinkedIn. Uh, so if you search for Ryan Reed JSR, uh, we'll okay. pop up to the top of your list. So feel free to reach out. Uh, it would be great to connect with people. But yeah, really appreciate the time, James. Uh, love talking about this subject. For me, it's it's definitely been a big benefit, both from a career perspective, but also from a leadership yeah. perspective about how I think about how I lead, but also uh, you know, impacting how others you know, work through their careers and live their lives. No, thanks. And I think, uh, you know, that just reminded me too, of one, maybe one last point. If you're thinking about how else you can differentiate yourself as a leader, I think take these examples from what Ryan's done around taking a personal interest in people and developing them. Because in my experience, a lot of leaders either don't know how to do, or do that, shy away from that, don't think it's as important as, as important of getting the wash out. And so I think really that could be something that could really make you very different inside your organization or uh, kind of externally inside your peer group. Um, so Ryan Reed, thanks for uh, being with me. And I look forward to sharing this. I'll also include, as you, as you mentioned, in the show notes, some things and some resources for people if they want to go inside and do a little bit of that introspection. I, I'll leave some uh, kind of tools and references for you to go do that. And Ryan, uh, appreciate you being a part of this podcast. Yeah. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Right. It's been fun. Yeah. Take care.